and we've been contrasting it to the Levitical priesthood. And Jesus did not have a priesthood that involved sacrificing animals. Okay, just... His was a priesthood of communion, and that's important because he's not offering something on an altar. He's offering something on a communion table, if you understand what I mean. You know, I mean, there's such a contrast of those two different things, and here's, here, okay, here's the contrast. Mediator, let me get this off. Mediator priesthood, I won't write it, but mediator priesthood as opposed to communion priesthood. What does it mean? It's not just terms. It's, a, it's an order. And the question is, do you order your life after this? Is your mind ordered after this? <clears throat> Why isn't he offering something on an altar? Because, and why is he offering on a communion table? Because this priest, this Melchizedek priest, did do a mediator work. He did do a mediator work. And he finished that part of the work. And he settled it, and he died, and he put away sin so that now we could commune with him in oneness, not so that we would, folks, you're no longer a sinner saved by grace. I'm sorry, you're not. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You are, according to the New Testament, you are a saint. Now, you're not a saint like, you know, the Catholic Church makes saints. Trust me, I've, I've seen your life. <clears throat> but you are a saint according to God's view of what he did. See, if he called you a saint according to the way you lived, he'd be a liar. <clears throat> he calls you a saint according to the finished work that he did and the oneness that you have with him because though your life may not measure up to that right now, it is, the, it is not only the standard, it is a fact. Okay? So this, this is, this is uh, once, once he's become functioning as a Melchizedek priest in communion, that means a whole lot of stuff is settled. Okay? The mediator work is done. It's settled. And he's coming on a completely different basis, and that's an eternal priesthood. Because he's treating you like you're one. He's treating you like you're a fa your family. He's treating you like this thing is settled. And he's doing it by feeding it to you. He's not sitting down and teaching it to you. He's not standing up and killing an animal for you to keep you in good graces. He's treating you now like that was enough with that one sacrifice and that you are in good graces now. And he wants to commune with you over it. It's, let's just say it's important to him, it's important to his priesthood that you commune with him over these things instead of continually acting as if you're a Jew trying to get back into good graces with God. So, um, the, the need for sacrifice has long been met. It's, it's been met and accepted, and now we have come to new life. We have come to the Holy of Holies. We're not trying to get there, we're there. And, you know, th along that same line, uh, mediator priest or communion priest, there is no brazen altar in Zion. Back over there in Shiloh, where there was a tent, there was a brazen altar. There was, you know, all the different elements. But if you went in the Holy of Holies, the ark wasn't there. Of course, nobody did because only the priests went in once a year. 
And if you can imagine the job of the priest, and this is the Levitical priest, the job of the Levitical priest was to go in there and, and, and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And there was no mercy seat. The ark and the mercy seat are one. And he just went in there and faked it. Went through the motions, you could say. Well, where, where was that Ark of the Covenant? It's up on Zion, up there on the hill in David's backyard. He put it in his backyard, put a tent around it, and went in, and, and he's going in the Holy of Holies, folks. And he, what tribe was he of? Levi? What tribe? Judah. Judah. So, you know, so he didn't have any right to go in there unless he was a Melchizedek priest. And you know what? If anybody has a right to go into that where there's no brazen altar, it's a Melchizedek priest. You know, we all look at that. See, we, we're all amazed because we're so Levitical. We're amazed. We go... We, 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 we see him going in the Holy of Holies and dancing before the Lord, not being struck dead when only the high priest was supposed to do that, and that was only just once a year, and he's going in every day and having a good time before the Lord. And not only that, he's going in there, and he's eating the showbread, which was only for priests. And we're all amazed. That's a big deal to us. We're going, well, how does he do that? And David's looking at us going, well, how is it you don't? You know, if you're a Melchizedek priest, I mean, David's the one who brought it up. He's the only guy who brought up Melchizedek after Genesis 14. The only guy. And, and apparently he was listening to God. I think David did that a lot. See, I'm going to give you a little picture here. Picture the throne room, God in there, father, son sitting at his right hand. Now picture us, this is just a picture. Picture us going in there. And we go in there, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to go in there and we're going to talk. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to tell God what we need and what we want and what we need God to do for us. And then we're going to leave. But I kind of picture David slipping in there and then getting off in a corner where God didn't see him and just sitting there listening to God commune. That's where you get this thing that God swore thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Where did he get that from? That wasn't written in the Bible. He wrote it in the Bible. He, you, folks, the Bible came from God's heart. This isn't what it's all about. God's heart is. And he heard that in God's heart, and then it became Bible. Now, what I'm not suggesting is that we get revelation outside of the Bible. I'm suggesting, somebody said to me, well, you know, isn't there more, you know, isn't there a lot more stuff that we could get that's not written in the Bible? I said, look, this was one of our students, and I said, look, when you get all the stuff in the Bible down, then you can think about that. <laughs> so they didn't like that, and they left. It's true, true story. <clears throat> <clears throat> Nonetheless, I'm sorry, folks. I don't think anybody ought to be thinking extra biblical revelation until we got all the biblical revelation down. Okay, that's just my thought, you know. And I'm sure that there are wiser men who know more than I do. But I'm sticking with that. I figure the Holy Spirit's going to use the Word of God all the days of my life and, you know. But anyway, the whole point that I really brought that up was just to say David heard that from the heart of God and then wrote it in the Bible. What does that say? Well, we need to quit, you know, as it were, using God as a, as a means to fix our earth life. We need to do like David. Just get in there, shut up, and let God not even know you're in there because you're so quiet. and He, he can't imagine a person, another person in there that's not asking questions or trying to get their everything fixed you know what I mean he, can't, he could so so when David comes in and doesn't say anything and just sits and listens he forgets about him because he's not used to that <laughs> so God communes father son holy spirit and David gets to pick up on all this stuff from the heart of God and boy did he ever pick up on stuff from the heart of God 
And what does the Bible say? Well, I'm, uh, it totally verifies what I'm telling you. God said David is a man after my own heart. After my heart, not my head or my hands. Do something for me or teach me something. Big, big, big difference there. <clears throat> All right. So this, this Zion is a contrast. It is a Melchizedek and at the same moment now, at the same moment, down in Shiloh, way off over there, there was the Moses tabernacle. At the same moment, there was a David's tabernacle on Mount Zion. One representing the Levitical priesthood, and all the priests were where? On Mount Zion? No, not the Levitical priests. They were over at Shiloh, going through the motions. God wasn't even there. He wasn't even there, but they're going through the motions like he was. Does that sound, does that sound current? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, but David is just, woohoo, you know, and you know, David didn't go like this, you know, come up to the, to the, the tent door, you know, and pull back the curtains and, and shut it and go, Oh my God, there's no brazen altar. Where's the brazen altar? I need to, you know. He, he was, you know, he wasn't go, I need to run down to Shiloh and go through the first half. He just walked in because he understood that this thing was based on life. It's based on Christ. It's not based on us. And it's not based on our goodness. And it's not based on our badness. It's based on our Christness. <laughs> it's based on him. And to know him and to be conformed to him and to be changed into his image and to have Christ in you, the thing that, that not only gives hope to you, but is a hope to the Father, his hope. I want Jesus out of you. You know? So, um, <clears throat> but I'd, I'd mention this thing of... Uh, Let's turn to Hebrews 12. I'd mentioned this thing of, um, you know, what is, what is your order? What is your mind ordered after? And um, I was thinking about this thing about him not sacrificing animals and of, of this whole way that he is. Um, and, and it brought me to this, this, thing here in Hebrews 12 about the difference between punishment and chastisement. How many of you believe that if you do something wrong, God's going to punish you? Okay. 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 Well, I think it's a common belief. I think it's a common belief that we think that if we do something wrong, God's going to punish us. Well, okay, maybe, maybe we just have a misunderstanding in terms or maybe we have the wrong order. So let's, let's, let's talk about it, let's discuss it. God, if you do something wrong, there's a good chance that your father will chastise you. Right? A lot of people treat going before God, and I'll use the same picture of like going before a throne, they treat it exactly the way they did when they first got saved. But when you first got saved, you went as a sinner to God. And you said, oh God, you didn't call him Father. You said, oh God, I've offended you, I've offended your law, and I've sinned, and I've done all this stuff. And you went as a sinner. Am I right or wrong? But now, we're supposed to go to our Father. You know? You can find that, I'm not going to turn there, but you can find that in, in 1 John chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's got some in it. Where this now th is a family relationship thing. And it is based on oneness and it's based on a mediator thing being settled. So that if you, th you, know, if you think I did something wrong and oh God, now I'm going to get punished for doing what I did wrong. Then you don't understand the Melchizedek priesthood. You don't understand the cross. And you don't understand what Christ has accomplished 
and what we're supposed to be walking in. And that is simply this. Jesus bore the punishment. Jesus bore the punishment. Now, when it comes to chastisement, you're going to get chastised, but Jesus bore the punishment. Yeah. There's a difference between uh, chastisement and punishment. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're under the law, you break it. Oh, baby. <laughs> you're right. But again, we're trying to make a point that we're not under the law, that we're under the Melchizedek priesthood. But some people just have a, they just, it's just a matter of terminology. They don't understand the difference. So they'll say, well, I'll do something wrong. God's going to punish me meaning in their mind that he's going to chastise you. But he's not going to punish you for what you did wrong because he's already, Jesus was punished for all that we did wrong, okay? The judgment has been done. Am I right or wrong, folks? Is the judgment done? All right, so let's read here in uh, Hebrews 12, and uh, let's start at verse 5. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto sons. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay, first thing I want you to notice is we're not talking about punishment. We're talking about chastisement. All right? And <clears throat> there's a difference. I'll read on and then we'll see that difference, but it helps to probably set this up a little bit. Punishment is for what you did wrong. Chastisement is to bring you into what is right, or communion, to bring you into communion. Did you hear me? Punishment simply treats the symptom of what is wrong. It gets you back for what you did. Okay? Chastisement, the purpose of it is not getting you for what you did wrong, and this should be good information to help you with your kids if if you have kids, it's not about getting, hurting them for what, you know, they did or punishing them for what they did. It is chastisement is specifically meant to bring them into a greater reality of what they are and what they have. All right, so let's see that. We just read verse um, 4, and the whole point is, he says, God speaketh unto you as unto sons. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Listen to the words. He is cha he, whom he loves, he chastens. When you punish somebody, a lot of times you're upset with them. That's another way you can tell if you're punishing somebody. If you're... If you're upset with them, then you're probably punishing them. If you're upset because they're not where they ought to be and it's not Christ formed in them and you're loving them and receiving them, because notice the word, chasing it and score just every son whom he receiveth. Folks, punishment is, feels like rejection. Can I get an amen? Chastisement is a receiving of them. And I say right there, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. The whole nature and spirit of it is different. It is as if you're already in the family, you know, you're not going to get kicked out. Or, you know, you're doing that with children. If a, if a man has to correct his wife, and the word correct is the word along this same line, if a man has to correct his wife, she shouldn't be at fear all the time that you're going to get rid of her or something like that or, you know, whatever. She shouldn't be. Now, many are. But it should be a reality that I'm doing this because I receive you. Because I, what does it say? Love you whom the Lord loveth. In fact, it doesn't say loves. It says loveth. That's an ongoing process in the original Greek. And that's why they put the E-T-H at the end of it. Not King James, but... Greek meaning, an ongoing process that he loves you, and that's why he does this. Well, you were so firm. Well, I was firmly on your side. <laughs> do, do you get this? I'm firmly on your side. I'm firmly with you. I firmly receive you by doing this. All right. 
If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for whom God, uh, for what God, what son is he whom the Father chases not? But if you be without chastisement, of which all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Now, I've never, I don't think I've ever lingered on that verse before, but while I was reading it today, as a matter of fact, it dawned on me, or, or it, uh, the Holy Spirit sort of brought out this thing. If you are without chastisement, of which all are partakers, then are ye bastards. And I thought, now, I've, you know, I don't use that because I, you don't hear that much anymore, but it used to be a real big cuss word. <clears throat> but basically, it, it means that you were born out of a relationship that wasn't oneness, that wasn't married, that wasn't, right? And he's saying, all are partakers of chastisement. The, the question is, are you receiving it as chastisement? Are you being loved by it? Are you being received by it? Are you, being, are you in rejection over it? And if you are, then you're acting like you're not one. He couldn't say it any harsher. And he's saying, whatever, what, you know, I'm sorry for I'm using this, but I mean, whatever bastard there is out there in the world based on what we would call it, that's the spiritual meaning of which that's only a shadow. Come on. That's the real. That's an actual real thing right there. More real than anybody that ever did something like that out there. This is the problem when children, when wives, when husbands, when people from the Lord, when we don't receive what he's doing in the spirit of oneness as a communion priest, we receive it as a Levitical priest, as punishment. Or is this, am I just totally muddy in the water or is this helping? <laughs> Amber, am I making any sense here? <laughs> okay. You could say no, you know, I'll, then I'll just try to explain it harder. <laughs> But I mean, I'd never, I mean, I'd never seen that. I just realized that's the real. Anything else, no matter how, okay, no matter how bad it is, no matter how, we go, oh, look at that person or, you know, what he did and he, this is the result of it. Or we look at that person and, you know, use that term. That is nothing. That's a, just a shadow. The real failure is to continue to have our minds ordered after the Levitical priesthood and to go into rejection over these things instead of seeing incredible love and seeing that we are received so much more than just, I like you, you're family, you're one, I deal with you as a son, you're, you're, you understand? I mean, no matter, no matter how, I, you know, and I know this nowadays, everything's weird, but, you know, no matter how bad my kids might act, they're my kids. They're never not going to be my kids, you know. And I'm in the good part now. Woe to you that are just entering in the teenage year stuff. But, I mean, that's another story. But, I mean... You know, at no point were they not my kids. I mean, and there were some rough, rough times at, at time. And I remember going, you know, that's my kid. I love, the, the, while I'm in the middle of a heated discussion, I love you. I remember that so deeply so that I could not punish. I could only correct to bring in to the oneness that is already there and the receiving that is already in my heart, you know? I mean, it's a, it's, tough, it's a tough deal when you really love and you really receive and somebody questions it. You know, it's, it's even worse when the Lord really loves and really receives and we question it. Well, I'm sorry, but here's what you are. I mean, that's the term, and that's the real, and that's not a shadow. What does it mean? It means you're acting like you're not really in the family and that you were spawned out of something that is not permanent. 
there's meant to be assurance in the Lord. If, if this world heaves and throws and, you know, and is shaking, the Lord is not. And if you are being tossed and, you know, you feel like you're in a, you know, a boat being tossed all over the raging sea, Jesus is just walking on it without any problem. You know? The, the key isn't to get Jesus to do a miracle so that your emotions will calm down. Come on. The key is for you to get out of the boat and walk to him. From the same calm that he has. And to believe it and to receive it and to and to thank the Lord for it. And to rest, you know, anybody heard the term rest? This is the rest. This is the rest. All right, well, let's keep reading here, because this is this is all important stuff. Uh, verse eight or verse nine. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who corrected us and, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection than the father of spirits and live? Notice, notice what's going on here. You had fathers of the world and they corrected you and they weren't always right in their correction, were they? Sometimes they punished, didn't they? Come on, especially any of you that's, you know, over 50. You really got, you know, I mean, you really received some punishment. You know, at least I did. Punished, punished. You know, and it only, the only thing understood was punish, okay? But this says we should be in the subjection, listen to these words. This doesn't say, you should be in the subjection under the God of all authority. It could say that, couldn't it? But it says, rather be in the subjection under the Father of spirits and live. It didn't say be in the subjection, and do what's right. It could have. It should have. If we wrote it, it would have. <laughs> but thank God, some of these early guys actually had a revelation of Christ. Isn't that good? Anybody thankful for people who've had a revelation of Christ? My God, thank you. Ah. Thank you for your wording. It's so precious and real. Praise God. Be unto subjection unto the Father of spirits and live. You know, because you talk about punishment, it's be under subjection and get it right this time and don't mess up again. Levitical priesthood. Mediator priesthood. Still trying to bring you into it instead of commune with you into it. Commune you into it. All right. Well, there's more. Um, <clears throat> for they verily for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. Notice his motivation. Um, for, our, where is it? for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Notice it didn't say that, that he would chasten us for our profit, that it might take away sin or the wrong that we did. That's how, again, that's how we would write that because we're, we haven't seen the, the Melchizedek priesthood. And so, uh, and, and his chastening, <laughs> listen to this, his, because chastening, it, punishment's one thing, chastening is another. Chastening, his chastening is not to correct wrong but to make us partaker of what is Christ. That's what it says. Be partakers of his holiness. It didn't say make us partakers, make us, it could have said and make us holy. Couldn't it? And would we not have probably read it that way? But it didn't say to make us holy, it said make us partakers. Because that's what you're communing in, you're partaking of him. And you're partaking of anything that's him is all that is his. His holiness, his strength, his patience, his kindness, his love. See? So, I mean, is this an eye-opener to anybody? That these things 
that this is the heart of God and this is the heart of a Melchizedek priest is not to fix everybody and everything. Is there problems? Yes. Are they overwhelming? Yes. Does everything need fixing? Yes. Are you going to fix it? No. I'm going to bring, Jesus has already fixed it. I'm going to feed everybody on the truth of what he did. Amen? Well, there's more. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised by it. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way and let it be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Notice it's talking about seeing the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and by it defile many what did it say be you know follow peace make straight paths lift up your feeble hands and your feeble knees and your hands which hang down look diligently lest any man fail of what lest any man fail from keeping the commandments no, that would be a Levitical priest. Lest any man fail from the grace of God. How can you fail from grace? How can you fall from grace? If it's free and it's freely given and you didn't earn it, how can you fall from grace? Can you sin your way out of grace? No, grace covers sin. I mean, I'm just trying to make you think. You, 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 can't sin, you can't sin enough to get out of grace. Grace, that's why it, it, when Paul uses that term, it, it's, a, it's a Greek word that is super abundant grace. And, and I remember searching it out, and I'll never forget what I found. And I just, it just blew my mind. It said that super abundant grace is more grace beyond whatever you could sin up to. Well, that would make sense. He'd have to cover all sin, wouldn't he? Or they could, he couldn't just cover enough and then some slip by because then, it, because then he'd have to come and die again. Well, he's not going to do that. Why? Because he covered it all. So there is no sin that can make you fall from grace. There's no deed that you can do in terms of doing wrong or breaking commandments, if you will, that cause you to fail from grace. There's only the fact that you don't receive the oneness and the grace and become a partaker of this oneness that we have with him and commune with him in it, that you continue to function as a Levitical priest, looking at him as your mediator still, and he was your mediator, but then he finished that, looking at him as if he's still always working to get you back there and you're always working to mess up so that he could work to get you back. wrong order may I say you're out of order to the Melchizedek priest you are in order with the Levitical priest but it's going to cause you to, to fall from grace you check out Galatians when it talks about falling from grace it, it's, it's not talking about sinning it's talking about going at this trying to keep commandments to please God and that's how you fall from grace because you quit using that as your order as your way and you start trying to please God through your works now we all know you shouldn't try to please God from your works but the question is how many of us are constantly thinking if I do something wrong God's going to punish me no if you do something wrong your loving Father is going to come and, and deal with you in such a manner to bring you back into being partakers of all that is Him. That's His goal. He's not just, see, his, He's not just the master of order, meaning my role as Father and Father of all spirits is to keep everybody in order and to whip them when they're out so that I can whip them back into order. Well, that, that's, you know, that's just a, a glorified uh, headmaster of a school, principal. Am I right or wrong? I mean, if that's your goal, well, you know. No, no, you know, I just got a picture. The principal's job 
is simply to whip everybody that does wrong and to keep everything in order. The teacher's job is to bring them into stuff, but his job is to whip them to get them back. To, well, that's not the way it is with the Lord. That's not the way it is with the Father. The Father has done, and if you'll check this out, God sent his son. And God sent his son who died so that we could be one with the Father and one with the Son, one with him. And so that we could be sons of God by Christ and relate to the Father in that manner. So his whole goal isn't trying to, to uh, correct what's wrong. His whole goal is to, is to start training you to be a partaker of what's in his heart and what's settled. So that you're not always fearful. So that if you do mess up, you're not in fear and trembling. Oh my God, what's going to happen now? What's, you know, I should have done this or I, I did this act and this is going to bring on, again, welcome to karma. You know, we really actually are part of another religion, not that one. We're not Hindus or Buddhist or whatever, you know. We, we're... We're not even Christians in the, in the greater extent. We are sons of God. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. All of those terms speak of oneness. We are branches. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are sons of God in the family. Every one of those speak of settled oneness, bringing you into a relationship that cannot be shook and will not end. You know, and when I teach like this, uh, you know, people, their minds go so many different directions. You know, you just want them to go to the Lord, but they go off. And, and so I was teaching this once, and somebody came to me and said, so, so then you believe once saved, always saved. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I told them this. I said, well, I got saved once, and I planned on always being saved. <laughs> so, you know, I guess I do, you know. <clears throat> But, I mean, my point being this. No, no, I believe, I, I believe this is saying that you can fail of that. You can get off. You can go back to the old. That You can leave that. But it's, it's settled in his heart. And the only reason why that would happen is because you refuse to embrace the new covenant. That's all. That would be the problem. The problem would never, in other words, the problem would never be with God. He's made provision enough but he also gave you free will. Everybody say free will. Yeah, he gave you that. And he, want, he didn't just, see, he didn't just want robots. And he didn't just want parrots and, you know. And if, you know, somebody says, well, you know, God wants us to not sin and to do everything he wants and to wait, you know, to be good messengers and good servants. Well, he had that with angels. They wait on him hands and foot. They never sin. They, you know, why not just make more angels? Why make us? We're a mess. Why make us? I mean, you know, come on. If it was just about not sinning and all that, he wouldn't have messed with us. He'd have just, you know, he said, I got everything I need in the angels. He doesn't have everything he needs in the angels. The angels are trying to look into why he's interested in us. Well, I'm going to tell you why. He gave us a heart where we could love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and that we could choose him, and that even if we mess up, he's, his will and his heart and his desire for oneness is more important than my mess-ups and my desire for self-pity or self-condemnation or to, you know, to feel cleansed because I beat myself. My God. What are you, Catholic? Well, I mean, you know, that's, you know, as if that's giving you right standing with God. I'm sorry. No. He just gave you free will and you can do with it, you can do with him and with his heart any way you please it's up to you you can doubt you can fear you can you can think you know think think your little squirrely thoughts is what's coming to my mind <laughs> you know and and they're just wrong it's you know, it's just just darkness 
It's just darkness. And it's just, it's just out of the light. It's not embracing the light. It's not embracing the love. It's not embracing the reality as God holds it in his heart and saying, you know, the only thing that's important is your view. My view is messed up. I'm a weaker vessel. I'm going with you. I'm going with you. And then get up and go with it. You know, that's not a little thing you go, oh, I'm going with you, and then get out and just continue to be separate. So, you know, it's the difference of failing. It's like failing your husband, and he's sitting there in a chair, and you come up and you kneel down, and you say, oh, I'm really messed up, and would you just pray for me, and I just can't seem to get it right, and I just, uh, why do you even like me? And, you know, and, you know, and you say, look, you know, here, commune, eat this. We're, we're one. Jesus is one. We're going to grow up in him. Don't focus on the negative. Focus on the reality of what we have in Christ. Eat this bread. Da, 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 da. And you say, okay, I'm just going to go with that. And you just sort of look down and you sit there. Instead of jumping up and just, you know, jumping him, you know, jumping in his lap in the chair and saying, oh, yeah, I'm, we're one. We're, we're together. You know? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> because that's what he wants. He wants us to believe him. Not believe his doctrines like believe in his religion. Believe his heart. Believe how settled he is. Anyway, gosh. I, just, uh, did I, I didn't even finish, or did I finish reading? Yeah. This, this whole thing, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and by it many be defiled. And interestingly enough, and I know that, that bitterness gets into a lot of people and stuff, and it, that can be from unforgiveness or, or somebody doing somebody wrong and all this, but in truth, these verses are talking about bitterness in relationship to oneness and not receiving the oneness and not... not receiving the end of chastisement, which is union and light and love and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a very good preacher. I know that. I'm just trying my best I can to communicate what I feel is the heart of the Lord and what he wants me to, to try to get to you. But that bitterness that can spring up and trouble you is just this thing of, of uh, you know, all of a sudden you start questioning God and then you're questioning your relationship and then you're questioning, you know, you, you just start questioning everything. And, and I don't have a problem with questioning, but I have a, que a problem with questioning that comes from unbelief. Because there's two different things. A questioning that comes from unbelief cannot be sa satisfied with answers. You can sit down and, I mean, you can temporarily satisfy somebody. Can I get amen? You can sit down and go, well, you know, this and that and that and da-da-da-da. And they go, oh, okay. But if there's still unbelief, doubts and stuff will come back over some other issue. And you're on a merry-go-round. You know, you just, you're just going round and round, and it's going to come back again. There has to come a time in these things where we're not just getting assurance of faith. We are Melchizedek priest. We're eating the bread. We're drinking the, the life. We're drinking of the life, and we're eating the bread as, as oneness with him. And I was going to get into all that, but, you know, we're a little short of time. What do we got? Okay. Maybe we can get into it. Look, let's look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <coughs> Because it'd be nice if I could uh, at least get this shared with you. And I'm sorry I f if I feel like I seem like I'm laboring or whatever, but I, this is beyond a teacher or a preacher. Uh, I feel so strongly these things from the heart of the Lord. And I, you know, I, I want us to honor the heart of the Lord in his and his desire to have us with him. What did I say? 1 Corinthians 11, is that what I said? <clears throat> okay, let's look in verse uh, 23 and 24. 
For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And so we begin to have this, this concept of Melchizedek uh, bringing bread and wine and Jesus in the, in the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, uh, delivering bread and wine again in that same spirit. And here we just lightly get a picture of that, and that is, uh, he says, uh, this is my body. You know, take it and eat it. You don't, full, you don't get the full impact of it when you read that. But if you look over in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, just the chapter in front of this, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one. Now, now I, want, I just want you to see this. He's talking about communion, amen? And he's talking about communing in something, but he's not talking about communing in rituals, and he's not talking about communing in doctrines that we all sit around and we go through a ritual and we say, I... I, I uh, believe that doctrine and all that. Listen to what the word says. He says, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Get it. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Uh, let's read the next. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are they not? They who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. So here he's saying, we're not just communing mentally in this he's saying literally we are that body we're that bread and you're taking this in symbolism and acknowledging the greater reality that when this was my individual body my incarnate body when I walked the earth this loaf but my body changed and it's still bread and it's still me, but now it got broken and it's put in all of you. But we're all one body and one loaf. Do you see what it's saying? And he's saying commune in that. Commune in the oneness that we have. Commune in the reality that I didn't just save you from sin, remission of sins. I, I've made you my body. All right, well, so, um, did I, yeah. So let's go to John chapter 6. And then you see sort of the cherry on top of this as he begins to express this true understanding of communion as he sees it, much more than just um, acknowledging elements, but literally acknowledging oneness with him. John 6, and let's start in verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, first of all, that's just weird if you don't understand communion. It sounds like cannibalism. Can I get a whoopee or something? I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just, that's just weird. First time I ever read that, I went, Ew. You know? I mean, Jesus, you're really cool, but this is sort of gross. Um, well, later on, he'll say, this is a hard saying. But he's talking spiritual reality, and, and he'll spell it out here. Uh, Eat my flesh and drink the blood. So you have no life in you. Notice the point of the communion is life in you. Come on. It's not doing right. It's not keeping commandments. It's not making you uh, doing an act of sacrifice that you're back in good graces. It is feeding you him so that his life is in you. Amen. Is that what it's saying or not? I mean, it is. I mean, it's undeniable, but let's keep reading. Verse 54, he who eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Remember our, our picture of eternal life? Um, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed or meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Verse 56, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. So notice it's saying that this is all about a, a greater reality than just communing in elements. This is saying 
I'm coming in you and you are in me. Your life is not in you anymore. Your life is in me. My life is in you. Well, he's not finished yet, thank God. Verse 57, as the li- and so this is his example of that. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. The point of communion, the point of a Melchizedek priest is to feed people on this oneness that is Christ, putting Christ in them, developing the reality of Christ that is within them so that uh, they begin to be awakened to not uh, that I'm freed from sin, Melchizedek priest was before there was sin and will be long after there is no sin. It is that I am one with him, that he died not just to save me from sin, but to make me one. That's two different things. I mean, everybody knows he died to, to free me from sin. Everybody needs to know he died to make me one. And that will last all eternity. The issue of sin, I don't think, you know, 800 billion years from now, we're going to be sitting around the throne going, oh, you know, coming to Jesus like he's still our mediator. Oh, would you help me? I just sinned. What part of heaven did you do that in? Well, over in the corner. (laughs) You know, I'm just saying dumb terms. But I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's as if we think we're going to continue being us. No, I mean, hopefully we have eaten enough to realize we're going to live by him. That's what it says in no uncertain terms and absolutely is spelling out this thing of communion, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. This is so that you live by me. This isn't just so that you get forgiven of sins. It says it right there. So that you live by me. And he said, I did the same thing. I communed with my father. And I live by him as the living father has sent me and I live by the father. See, he didn't say as the living father sent me and I live for God. This, I'm talking verse 57. He could have said that, couldn't it? Couldn't verse 7 read, as the living father hath sent me and since he sent me, I serve God and I, I live for God. That would, again, be the way that we translate this because we're still mediator priests instead of covenant priests. But a, co- a covenant priest A communion priest would say, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, even so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Melchizedek showed up. He said, I'm not here to rebuke you or to congratulate you. I'm here to feed you. (laughs) I'm here to commune with you on this most high God and the true way to commune with him is not by talking about him you know it'd be like the bread of life okay well we're going to discuss the bread of life okay now what ingredients go into that well you got it takes a little bit of flour and you got to have this and you got to have that and everything and when you mix it all again and, and you stir it real slowly and then you add in some milk and everything like that and, and then we say well praise God wasn't it nice that we communed in the bread of life and then everybody goes home Folks when you go to church it's not about swapping recipes You know, talking about all that goes into it. Folks, it's about partaking, taking in Christ. He's increasing and you're decreasing. That's what it's about. And when do you do that? Give us this, give us this month our daily bread. No, give us this week. Give us this Sunday our daily bread. Give us day by day. Partaking, eating, drinking, him, bringing it in with one purpose, that I may live by him. That I may live by Christ, that it might be truly Christ in me. As Paul said, I am crucified. I no longer live. 
Padre, con Cristo estoy juntamente crucificado. Y ya no vivo yo. I no longer live. Más vive Cristo en mí. Christ lives in me. Not doctrine. Not swapping the recipe of it. Not talking about the ingredients of it. Not coming to a class and just getting ingredients. Not coming to church and just getting ingredients. Coming and getting hungry. Coming and thirsting. Coming and wanting this reality to be our reality so that when we go out of here, we feed it to others because we're Melchizedek priests and we realize this is our purpose. This is why we live. Jesus, when he had the disciples there, said, this is my body. This represents, I want you to live by me. He could have just as well said that. I want you to live by me. Take it, eat it, put it in you. You know, he didn't hold it up and say, now let me tell you what went into this. Let me tell you the ingredients and the, the chemical reaction that it causes when, you know. He said, I don't want to talk about it. I want you to eat it. I want you to get it in you. So, folks, in closing... Sorry for all the people listening. But, but there has to become a change of order. A new order has come. It's not about you getting right with God and him helping you through your daily life to, to, to cover your sins and all of that. That's fine and that's good. But folks, if you, that's your emphasis, if that's your focus, then you're still of the wrong order. We could live after that, and we could, we could just constantly run to the throne room and get God to, to forgive our sins, couldn't we? But there's a better way. If Christ increased within us, there would be a decrease of sins in us. Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, my God, you know, wouldn't it be a better plan instead of fighting sin and fighting darkness with killing Jesus that we, we take the life of Jesus and we put him in us? We let him live. Victory in Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. Well, we need to quit. <laughs> what, what was the guy's name in Job, the young guy? What was it? Elihu. Elihu. I'm full of the matter. I am like new wine. Um, like a wine skin filled with new wine, just bursting out. And yet I can burst and bubble all I want. But, but somebody has to get hungry for Jesus and say, you know what, I want this and I want him today and I want him tomorrow and I want him moment by moment and I want to make this place holy ground so that we get Christ and that others can come and get Christ. And that we live our lives to establish a Melchizedek priesthood in a place where people can come and go and grow in that and, and fellowship in it. Father, we just ask you to quicken reality to us. Help us not to just sit and listen or learn, but to eat. Not learn, but eat. No amount of teaching will do that, but Holy Spirit, only you can break the bread of life. Feed your people and help us as Melchizedek priests to put the emphasis where it needs to be on eating, taking in his life and not fixing ours. Not like the old covenant that was all centered on fixing our life, but on the new covenant priesthood that is all centered on being filled with his life. Father, do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And do it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.